Ladies and gentlemen, I am pleased to announce the arrival of Mr. George Yeo, Minister for Foreign Affairs of Singapore. It's my pleasure now to invite Professor Kishore Mabubani, Dean of the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy, to deliver his welcome remarks. Minister Giorgio, uh, distinguished guests, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you to the second uh, Global Public Policy Network, or as we say, GPPV, GPPN conference on behalf of the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy, uh, and also on behalf of our GPPN partners, uh, namely SIPA of Columbia University, uh, LSC, and Sciences Po. Indeed, we are happy to build on the good work done by Sciences Po at the first GPPN conference in Paris uh, in October last year. Now, in my opening remarks, uh, uh, I will touch on three areas. Firstly, uh, I'll try to explain why a global public policy education conference is necessary. Second, I'll touch on the theme that we have chosen, uh, globalizing Asia or Asian globalization. Thirdly, it'll give me great pleasure to introduce our guest of honor uh, Minister Giorgio. Uh, I'll try to do all this in less than 10 minutes, so please forgive me if I sound a bit abrupt <laughs> uh, in my remarks. Uh, on the first point, just let me state uh, very bluntly that public policy education is still very much a new enterprise. Uh, unlike business schools, uh, uh, where the industry has clearly matured, public policy education is still finding its way. Uh, we know, for example, what to expect when a graduate comes to us with a master in business administration, an MBA. But do we know what to expect when a graduate comes to us and says he has a master in public policy or a master in public administration or a master in international affairs? So in doing some research uh, for this speech, I found a fascinating quote from uh, Graham Allison, a former dean of the Kennedy School of Government in Harvard. And he actually describes vividly the fierce resistance uh, from the Harvard faculty then to the establishment uh, of the Kennedy School of Government. And these are some quotes, uh, what they said. Uh, Two thirds of the faculty of the political science department, and I quote him now, felt strongly that this was a bad idea and shouldn't happen. Uh, the economics department believed that if there was anything important uh, to know about economics and government, we know it already and we are already teaching it. We don't need another entity, a Kennedy School of Government. And of course, all this was reinforced by the standard arts and sciences view that this Kennedy School is just a trade school and not as intellectually distinguished as Harvard is expected to be, unquote. Now, while the Kennedy School of Government is obviously uh, very well established today, and I'm very pleased also to uh, tell all of, all of you that the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy uh, has a very strong, long-standing partnership with the Kennedy School. Uh, while all this, while the Kennedy School, of course, is very well established, I'm not sure that the resistance to public policy education has disappeared completely. I think nor have we reached a consensus on the curriculum or the nature of public policy education. And here I'm going to pose some questions. What, for example, is the difference between multidisciplinary teaching and interdisciplinary teaching? Have we successfully integrated all the different elements into public policy education? Do we even agree on what the elements are of a good public policy education? 
and this, of course, is a very dangerous question to pose. Do our students leave our school confused or enlightened after a multidisciplinary or interdisciplinary education? In short, uh, we have hard questions to answer, and this is why tomorrow's sessions are very important because they address uh, some of these very hard questions in a very direct fashion. But fortunately, there is also a consensus that public policy education is a sunrise enterprise. Uh, as Derek Bok, the then president of Harvard, said when Kennedy School was established, he said, since government has gotten so much more complicated, you couldn't just walk in there with a business or law degree. And Paul Volcker, the very famous former head of the Fed, and who's actually, uh, by the way, also a member of the governing board, the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy, has said, and I quote, the need for more effective governmental administration for providing leaders with the skills and knowledge that they need is enormous. Yet, in nearly all countries, large or small, public management has not received the attention it requires. And this is why we need uh, more global conferences on public policy education like this one. And we are very confident that you and your presence here will make a significant contribution uh, in this area. Now, let me turn to the second point. And I will say a little less in the area about the theme of the conference because I'm confident that Minister Giorgio will enlighten us in this area. But the theme was an obvious one for us to pick uh, for this conference. First, globalization is the single biggest force affecting our lives on this planet. Second, the rise of Asia is also going to transform our world beyond recognition. So what will the results be? And the honest answer, of course, we don't really know. Uh, and this is why we have so many distinguished panelists here to answer the question. But let me very briefly give you my personal prediction, and I try to put my personal prediction in four words. I, I predict that what we will see as a result of all this is the Asianization of globalization. And like public policy education, uh, this too, the Asianization of globalization is the sunrise enterprise. And with this, you will understand why we feel so privileged uh, to be part of the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy because we are participating not in one, but in two sunrise enterprises. Finally, it gives me great pleasure now to introduce our guest of honor, Mr. Giorgio. He's had a truly distinguished career. He graduated with a double first degree in engineering from Cambridge University in 1976. Later, in 1983, he went to Harvard Business School, graduating with an MBA with high distinction, Baker Scholar. He retired from the armed forces with the rank of Brigadier General in 1988 and joined politics, where he enjoyed, as all Singaporeans know, a meteoric rise. He became a minister in 1990 at the age of 36, and since then he has served in many different ministries, including information in the arts, health, trade industry, and Ministry of Foreign Affairs, where I had the pleasure of working with him uh, personally. Now, please allow me just to tell you one short story uh, that speaks volumes about Minister Yeo. In 1989, he led the Singapore delegation to the Non-Aligned Movement Summit meeting in Belgrade, uh, Yugoslavia, when we still had a Yugoslavia in those days. And in Belgrade, now as part of this group, a Yugoslav national, I think he was of Slovenian origin, if I remember correctly, gave us a tour of the city, describing the rich history of the region and what had gone on for centuries over there. And when he finished his account, Minister Giorgio picked up the tale and proceeded to tell him even more about the rich history of the region, giving our Yugoslav guide facts and insights about Yugoslavia and its history that he himself had never heard before. And this is a vi vivid and powerful demonstration of the remarkable uh, background of Minister Giorgio. And this is why we're very privileged today to have him here with us to, to declare open our conference. And with this, I'd like to welcome, welcome you, Minister Yeo, to deliver your opening address. Thank you.
dear friends, ladies and gentlemen, I'm delighted to join our view this morning for the opening of the conference about Asia. Last week, I visited the Pearl River Delta after many years. The last time I did a complete tour of the Delta was in April 1992, two or three months after Deng Xiaoping's famous sudden tour. Since then, the transformation which has taken place is truly dramatic. Guangzhou has become a major metropolis and will become one of Asia's great cities. Near the beach at Human, where the Qing commissioner Lin Zixi destroyed opium belonging to the British East India Company, which led to the Opium War in 1840-41. A beautiful new bridge now connects Nansha on the right bank with Tongkwan on the left bank. And the whole area has become one large urban conurbation. From there, I went to Shenzhen. And Shenzhen is no longer just a jungle of skyscrapers. Learning from Singapore by the open acknowledgement of its city leaders, Shenzhen is now lush with tropical vegetation, comparable to what you see here. A few months ago, the mayor was here with a large delegation, and they studied many facets of what we do in Singapore in public policy and visited our mango reserve at Sungai Buloh. And I have no doubt that they will do better than us in many areas, including the conservation of their wetlands. And this new Chinese city has become an attractive living habitat. From Shenzhen, I crossed over by ferry to Macau which has grown so remarkably, it has already overtaken Las Vegas last year in terms of gambling revenues. And in 10 years, it'll be much larger than Las Vegas. Sheldon Edelson of Sands is building 20,000 hotel rooms in Macau. His first casino on the mainland, rough and ready, was such a hit the cost was recovered in nine months. And at the Venetian, which has 3,000 suites, I was told that the market value of the retail area alone will cover the cost of the entire development. So the rooms and the casino, that's all gravy. To ensure easy passage to and from Hong Kong, SANS is building a fleet of 11 ferries so that every 20 minutes, there'll be a boat to Macau and back from Macau. And there's a plan to build a long bridge linking Hong Kong to both Shenzhen and Macau. And in Hong Kong, the economy is revving away, fueled by the tourism flow from China. And a friend told me that one sh watch shop ran out of Rolex watches. The Pearl River Delta is a major growth pole in Asia, and it is but one of many. Further north, the Yangtze Delta is an even larger phenomenon than the Pearl River Delta, and will probably become the greatest center of economic activity in the entire world. Further north, the Pohai Gulf, from Tallinn, the Liaotong Peninsula, sweeping round down, to Shangtung is a buzz with development. And further inland, Chongqing, Chengdu, Xi'an are all exploding. And it is not only China. Vietnam's trot has become a canter. Within a few years, Vietnam will break into a gallop like China. And India. India is beginning to look very interesting. Although less homogeneous than China, 
Poles of development are, are also emerging, centered on Delhi, Mumbai, Chennai, Bangalore, Hyderabad, and Calcutta. Despite relatively poor infrastructure and rather complicated domestic politics, the Indian economy is growing easily at 8 to 9%. And once the bottlenecks are decongested, India's growth will also be in double digits. Further west, the Gulf states are flush with money from oil and gas. Abu Dhabi alone has reserves of over a trillion dollars. With the growth of Asia keeping world energy prices high, the Middle East has become both an important market and an important source of finance. Mega developments have become so commonplace that if you have a project less than a billion dollars, that's just small beer. In between these growth poles are countries and regions which lag behind for reasons of politics or culture. Sooner or later, they'll be dragged along. I don't think they can drag us down, but we can't be too sure. In Northeast Asia, it is important to hold out hope to North Korea of rapid economic development once it changes policy. It is the increasing economic integration between Taiwan and the mainland which will bring about reunification. In Southeast Asia, it is absurd that while everyone else is powering ahead, Myanmar has switched into reverse gear. In India, even states like Uttar Pradesh will eventually be brought into the 21st century. And Bihar is already stirring. India's growth in turn puts pressure on other countries in South Asia, like Pakistan, to adopt similar economic policies. The Middle East, however, faces political problems that the tide of economic development may not be able to overcome. With its long history and its great wealth of human and natural resources, Iran ought to be a center of growth. But it has become a source of instability which can plunge that region to war. The problems of Iran, Iraq, Afghanistan, and Palestine are unfortunately so intertwined. Solving these problems simultaneously, and it seems that the only way to solve these problems is to solve them simultaneously, <coughs> becomes fiendishly difficult. From a long-term perspective, we can be optimistic about the prospects for East, Southeast, and South Asia. Of West Asia, I'm less sure. But over the short to medium term, we face important challenges in North Korea, the Taiwan Straits, and Myanmar. Things can still go badly wrong and derail our progress. We must work at them and progressively build structures, including institutional structures, which promote cooperation enable, and enable conflicts to be peacefully resolved or managed. North Korea and Taiwan are two problems which I do not need to go into. The key is keeping sino us relations on an even keel. The Chinese are completely hard-headed in their assessment. They openly say this, that sino us relations can never be very good, but neither can they go very bad. The interdependence has become much too great. The only regional institution where these two big powers come together is APEC, which must remain the most important regional organization for us. When problems suddenly arise, such as during the U.S. Pipeline incident over Hainan in the spring of 2001, it was APEC which provided a ready forum for both sides to meet. The problem of Myanmar has deep roots in its history. Wu Tan's great grandson, Tai Min Wu, reminds us of this in his excellent book, The River of Lost Footsteps. The Western embargo cannot work so long as Myanmar's giant neighbors, China and India, do not go along. For them, Myanmar is a buffer state, 
which neither side wants to see destabilized. ASEAN has moral influence, but little economic leverage. At the coming East Asia Summit on 21st November, which brings China, India, and ASEAN together around the same table, together with Japan, Korea, Australia, and New Zealand, the leaders will be discussing how we in the region can support UN Special Envoy Ibrahim Gambari in his mission. And in addition to APEC, the East Asia Summit is another important regional organization because it brings China and India together. For us in Southeast Asia, ASEAN is our best hope for the future. If we are divided, the region will be balkanized. It is a strategic part of the world through which pass the world's most important sea lanes. If we are not united, the major powers will all be forced to interfere in our affairs in their own self-defense. For this reason, expelling Myanmar from ASEAN is not an option. Next month, at our summit in Singapore, ASEAN leaders will sign the ASEAN Charter, which will provide the constitutional basis for our future integration. It is a major milestone which the problem in Myanmar will not stop us from crossing. And we fully expect Myanmar to sign the Charter as well. In all this, what is Europe's role? It is mainly for Europe to decide. A stronger European presence in political, economic, and cultural terms is welcomed by everyone in Asia because it gives us more room to play. ASEM, Asia-Europe meeting, was started precisely to encourage closer links between Asia and Europe. Unfortunately, Europe is too often preoccupied with its own integration. Externally, relations with the US, Russia, China, and the Middle East consume most of Europe's remaining energies, with not very much left for us in Southeast Asia. Europe's interest in us tends to be issues-based. After the Boxing Day tsunami, the generosity which flowed from Europe was truly heartwarming. On Myanmar, there's an idealism which we admire but cannot afford. It is not good for Europeans to see ASEAN through the lens of Myanmar alone. We hope that the coming ASEAN-EU summit on November the 22nd will begin a process of greater European involvement in ASEAN, including sp speedy negotiations for an ASEAN-EU free trade agreement. If we can maintain the peace in Asia for another generation, large parts of Asia will enter the first world, and it will become a very different world. And institutional development, good public policies will be an important part of the challenge. But it is in the nature of human beings to be contentious even when they cooperate. We need to improve existing international institutions and establish new ones to govern our common affairs so that global challenges like climate change, pandemics, terrorism, and financial instability can be effectively addressed. How Asia changes the world will, as Kishore said, be a major theme of this century. Thank you very much. Thank you, Minister Yeo. We will now begin our first plenary session on global governance, the Asian impact on the new political architecture. May I invite the chair of the session, Professor Kishore Mabubani, and the speakers to take their places on the stage. We have Surin Putsuwan, Member of Parliament from Thailand, Pratap Banu Mehta, President and Chief Executive at the Center for Policy Research, and Anne-Marie Slaughter, Dean of Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs at Princeton University.
Uh, well, good morning again, everybody. Uh, let me begin uh, with the good news. Uh, we are ahead of schedule. <laughs> so um, what, I, what I'll do while uh, our speakers are being uh, mic'd up is to just say a few brief words about this panel session. And frankly, uh, all I have to do to, ex to reiterate the importance of this session is to repeat what the minister said in his last two, three lines. Huh? We need to improve existing institutions and establish new ones to govern our common affairs so that global challenges like climate change, pandemics and terrorism, and financial stability can be effectively uh, addressed. I was also going to mention, and I forgive me for this uh, uh, commercial, that uh, I believe very strongly that the rise of Asia is going to change everything, that I'm actually coming out with a new book in February next year, which is called The New Asian Hemisphere, The Irresistible Shift of Global Power to the East. And I, and I believe very strongly that, that the rise of Asia is going to change everything. And this is why, frankly, we do need to uh, address this question about how do we prepare for these changes. And here I can say very, very quickly that we have, of course, an unusually uh, distinguished panel uh, here to address it. Uh, what, we, what, what I'll do is I'll briefly uh, introduce each of the three panelists, and then they will come up to the podium uh, and speak for 10 minutes. Uh, my job is to be an effective timekeeper so please look at me as you're speaking. If you see me waving frantically, you know that 10 minutes uh, are up. Uh, we will begin uh, with uh, Surin Pitsuan, who is, of course, uh, very well known to many of you. Uh, he's been uh, a long-standing uh, major figure in Thai politics. Uh, he was foreign minister previously. But the single most important fact, I'm not going to go into details because, you know, in, in your booklets you have all the, the, the CVs and the bio data down there. Uh, the, the most important fact that you need to know about him is that he will become uh, the next Secretary General of ASEAN from January uh, 2008. And given the, the growing importance of ASEAN uh, internationally, you can see what a major role uh, he will have to play um, in, in the years to come. So it's wonderful to have him give us his perspective. He will then be followed by uh, Professor Anne-Marie Slaughter, who is the Dean of the Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs. And what's remarkable about Anne-Marie, and she's also a good friend of mine, like Surin, is how active she is in the world of academia and also as a major public intellectual uh, in America. Uh, she, whenever she speaks, uh, and I've heard her speak at so many fora, she's a real force uh, to be contented with. And of course, uh, if you want me to spread some rumors this morning, uh, there's a very strong rumor in Washington, D.C. that if the Democrats uh, uh, do come into power, please do not be surprised if Anne-Marie Slaughter ends up uh, with a major position in the uh, Nixon administration, but that's a rumor. <laughs> and last but not least, we have Pratap Banu Mehta, who is like Anne-Marie, uh, also another good friend of mine, also a major uh, public intellectual in India. I've had his, his uh, we first met in Harvard many years ago. Since then, I've also had the pleasure of listening to him speak uh, in, in New Delhi and other fora, and he always comes out with some remarkable new insights uh, that really uh, lead, uh, leave everyone sort of, you know, a buzz about, gee, that's amazing what he just said. So anyway, we have this very distinguished panel. Without much further ado, Surin, I'm going to turn to you, and you have uh, 10 minutes uh, to be brilliant and provocative. <laughs> Thank you very much, Kishore. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> well, if the Democrats, part, Democrats come to power in Thailand, I won't be there to serve in any position. <laughs> because the ministers and the leaders have asked me to go down to Jakarta to serve as the Secretary General of ASEAN next term. But let me begin by saying that 
the Asia and Pacific has grown enormously, and the heat and the energy and the dynamism that have been created by that growth from India to Southeast Asia to China to Northeast Asia, including the Gulf, as the minister said, the heat and the dynamism certainly have put enormous pressure on the governance of the international arena. I think Asia's economic performance, financial influence, have been much, much less than our political and security influence in the world. Therefore, the last 20 years, you have seen a lot of demand and pressure and request for reforms, for adjustments, for accommodation of some of the Asian powers into the power structure of the world. The UN, the UN Security Council, certainly has been under tremendous pressure to open up, to reform itself, because it just doesn't make sense that you would leave the second largest contributor to the budget of the UN outside the supreme decision-making mechanism of the UN. Therefore, there has been a lot of talks about expanding and about including Japan and India. Well, we haven't gone too far in that direction, but certainly the pressure is on. When the financial crisis came to Asia, arrived in Thailand first, 10 years ago, we found out that the financial architecture of the world that has been set up after the war has also not been performing, partly because Asia was growing too fast, partly because Asia was not submitting to the norms and the values that those institutions were set up to monitor and to enforce. But for whatever reason, the IMF, the World Bank, the, the financial architectures were forced to look at themselves and to look for areas for reform. Therefore, there was something called G20, comprising of emerging financial powers, economic powers, a lot of them from Asia, in order to look for rooms for adjustments in the financial architecture of the world. Asia was growing so fast. The WTO was performing its role, but not as effective, not as quick, as fast as everybody wishes it. So the Asia-Pacific formed something called EPIC, the minister referred to. But EPIC itself is not traveling that, so, that quick, that fast, to the point where we are now not quite comfortable with the pace EPIC is moving. The minister said EPIC has become a foremost institution for forum for discussion of problems in the Asia Pacific. But not, not from the beginning. From the beginning, it was only for trade, it was only for economic cooperation. I remember in 1999 in Auckland, in New Zealand, when East Timor was burning, President Kim Dae-jung of Korea said, tomorrow at the retreat, I'll bring up the issue of East Timor. And I remember President Jiang Zemin of China said, if you bring up East Timor, I will walk out. Because EPIC was not supposed to be the place where you talk about security, when you talk, where you talk about political issues. Whatever the case, we now have East Asia Summit. We now are trying to establish our own supreme forum for East Asia community here in the Asia Pacific. The 
question is whether ASEAN plus three, the traditional three, adjacent to ASEAN, important to ASEAN, China, Japan, and South Korea? Or should it be open to outsiders? Again, adjacent to the region, but a bit far. New Zealand, Australia, and India. And there is some tension in the two formulas, reflecting the division, reflecting the discrepancy of opinions here in the Asia Pacific. I think what is emerging in the region is a sense of regionalism, a sense of community, but it has to be a community that is based on the ways that Asians do things, and outsiders oftentimes don't quite understand. We tend to do things incrementally. We tend to do things in a small framework. Northeast Asia, we came up with six-party talks. Because some countries, many countries, many powers, enormous economic financial powers, don't feel comfortable to open up the regions for outside powers to come in. I have a feeling that sense of jealousy, that sense of fear of outsiders will be with us for some time. And that sense of regionalism, if we don't handle it well, it could become a neo-containment policy approach. And that is, we will take care of our own problems here. Outsiders, please don't come in and interfere. That could be a trend, that could be a development in the future for this area. The second observation that I would like to make is Professor Bakwati talked about in the economic and trade negotiations, speckety bowl phenomena. Countries would make agreements on trades one-on-one -on -one bilateral, so that there are spaghetti lines, crisscrossing, serve as a bowl. I think in politics, I think in security, Asia is probably creating something called meatball plate. That is, we will try to resolve problems within our own neighborhood with less interference or less involvement from outside. Based on this observation, I would say the issue of Myanmar, Burma, will not be managed by the larger global community. It will have to be by the regional, the neighborhood community. There is now, what I understand, a formula that would involve all the Perm Five, plus India, plus Norway, plus Japan, plus a representative from ASEAN. I think precisely because some of the countries in the region don't want to internationalize the issue, don't want to open up the issue for too much involvement from outside. In the end, the issue of Myanmar will be and must be handled by the regional countries and powers and neighbors. It looks pretty logical. The Thai Prime Minister said, emulate the six-party talks in Northeast Asia on the Korean Peninsula. 
but he didn't really mean six. He meant the formula. He meant the framework. Let's move it to Southeast Asia. So I could see China. I could see India. I could see some form of representation must be from ASEAN, either in the form of Troika or in the form of the leader of the ASEAN, which is now Singapore, and the Myanmar government, Myanmar regime themselves. So whatever the world is thinking now, the world must also be aware of the fact that Asia Asians are pretty jealous of its own turf, are not quite comfortable with opening up the region for outside participation, would like to see it as internal, as regional, as small neighborhood framework, and therefore the issue of Myanmar probably most likely going to be handled effectively by the regional grouping. I think these kind of you know, small scales, regional approaches, small framework, trying to work out our own problems in the region will have to be accepted by the outside world for a few years to come. It cannot accept, and it will not accept readily, the regimes, the, even the norms, even the institutions that are being established long, long time ago because the problems in Asia, the problems in Southeast Asia, the problem in the Pacific have become very, very complex and have been based on the experiences and have been based on the kind of working experiences that we together have made in the past trying to resolve the problems within our region. So I do hope that whatever ideas, whatever efforts that we want to introduce to the international arena, there will be accommodation made for things Asia. There will be adjustment made to accommodate the pressure, the demand, and the necessity that Asia and Asians and ASEANs would like to see our own place in the supreme architecture of the world. Thank you very much. Thank you. So the question before us is whether the world is globalizing Asia or whether Asia is driving globalization. Now as a professor, if I take off my uh, dean hat, as a professor, I would answer that question very strongly that Asia is driving globalization. In terms of not just economic growth, but institutional forms. So 10 years ago, <coughs> excuse me, in 2007, with the hubris of youth, I wrote an article that was entitled The Real New World Order. I modified that title in the book I published five years afterwards and just said A New World Order. But in 1997, I argued that the future of global governance depended on developing an intermediate infrastructure of networks of national government officials, networks of health ministers, of finance ministers, of treasury officials, of environmental officials, all across the board. Those networks would be between formal international institutions, the UN, the WTO, the IMF, the World Bank, and national governments. And I argued that that those, that infrastructure, that intermediate layer, uh, was absolutely vital uh, to our ability to build a world order for the 21st century. This was not an argument received terribly well in the United States, host to the UN and the World Bank and the IMF. 
It was received even less well because I pointed to Asia as a leading example of building these kinds of networks. I also pointed to the EU because the EU, of course, operates through these networks. The Council of Ministers is a council of agriculture ministers or transport ministers or health ministers. It depends on what the meeting is. And that is the way the EU operates. But the EU, of course, is, has a treaty. It is hom homogenous. It, it is, I think, in many ways a model for the world, but in other ways it's quite sui generis. Asia, on the other hand, indeed, as Surin has just said, was pioneering this model in a much more diverse environment, was pioneering it in APEC, and not just the presidents, uh, the heads of state who go to APEC, or in the case of the United States, the heads of state who do not go to APEC, but also networks of all these different ministers. And indeed, as Surin mentioned, even outside of APEC, things like the G20, the meetings of the finance ministers that was heavily Asian, bringing other uh, finance ministers into the region to look at the problems of the East Asian uh, financial crisis. ASEAN, uh, again, when you look at the way ASEAN operates, it is not, a, until recently, it is not a formalized, hierarchical, treaty-based institution. It may become uh, so as it adopts its charter. It is a much looser uh, set of non-legalized networks of people who come together uh, and address common problems, uh, in, in, uh, often on an issue basis or at the, at the top levels. And now, of course, we see the proliferation of these networks, and we just again heard about them, the uh, Asian Regional Forum. So if you put APEC and ASEAN and the Asian, Asian Regional Forum and ASEAN plus three and ASEAN plus six, you have a... Uh, a wild uh, soup of acronyms, but what they are are networks of government officials. Those networks will become all the more important, and the Asian model for those networks will become all the more important because the problems we face in the 21st century are not all, but in large part, problems that cannot be solved in the traditional spaces of international relations. They are not problems for groups of ambassadors or groups of leaders to solve, problems of security, uh, problems of common spaces. They are problems that arise within individual countries, whether it's problems of terrorism or problems of global health academic, uh, epidemics or problems of, of the environmental disasters that face uh, so many of our countries. Those are problems that must be addressed by individual officials on the ground. They must be addressed by, again, the health minister, the environmental minister, the, uh, uh, the finance minister. And they have to be implemented, the solutions to those problems, through networks of the national government officials who come together, who collaborate to solve common problems, who distill knowledge and disseminate knowledge, who socialize one another, uh, if there is a long-term solution, solution to Burma, it will be in part because different Burmese officials are part of the ASEAN networks and are working with their counterparts and are finding new ways to do things and are opening up uh, to, to the world. Those networks are, exist already and will become all the more important because they are our tools to address so many of the problems of the 21st century. I am not writing out off the UN for a minute or those other international institutions. Those need reform. But those institutions won't work without these networks. So thus far, I've given an answer that Kishore should love, certainly from his new book. Uh, here it, Asia is in the forefront, not just of economic uh, globalization, but also institutional globalization, that we have a lot to learn from those kinds of networks. And that People like American political scientists like myself who believe in highly legalized, top-down, hierarchical institutions need to, to look at what's happening uh, in Asia. But I have been properly humbled as an American. I have just heard Minister Yo speak for 20 minutes, and I think he did not mention the United States once. I'm pretty certain. He certainly talked, he talked a great deal about Asia, and he talked a great deal about the EU. I think, he may have mentioned us in passing as that, you know, that country somewhere over across the Pacific, but we were not central to his analysis. Uh, I think Americans have to get used to that. 
Uh, I'm half Belgian, and I'm a deep Europeanist by training. I am living in Shanghai this year with my husband and my children so that my children understand Asia from an early age, as I believe they also need to understand Europe. So a world in which Asia and Europe are coming together, the world he described, is, I think, a very important vision of the world. I wouldn't count out the United States just yet. I think we've got 10 or 20 years left, maybe. Kishore, in his wonderful last book, uh, The End of the Age of Innocence, which all Americans ought to read uh, because it's a, it's a wonderful analysis of uh, the origins of anti-Americanism before George Bush. A lot of us can point at what, to what George Bush did that made people dislike us, but he points out things that we did in the 90s uh, that had a huge impact, as in not helping Thailand in the uh, financial crisis. But he says at the end of that book that the United States has, has key strategic decisions that it has to make. And he says the United States has to decide that it wants the world order that it did so much to build after World War II, that it wants to update that world order, that it wants to lead through international institutions rather than against them. And then at the end, he also says the United States needs to put its house in order at home. Now, those four decisions sound remarkably like the Democratic Party platform for every Democratic candidate I can think of, whether it's Hillary Clinton or John Edwards or Obama. All of them are starting with the United States has uh, lost face. It has lost its reputation. It's lost its moral reputation. It has lost its political legitimacy. It has, it, we must return to a different era. We must start with our own principles. We must rebuild at home. We must once again turn to these institutions and play an active role in reforming them. Indeed, that's not far from uh, the Romney political platform. Uh, regardless who wins. I, I mean, I think, I'm not certain about uh, Giuliani or McCain, but I think if you just look on sheer numbers, the bulk of American political candidates tell you that in 2009, you will have a United States that is once again committed to working with other nations and rebuilding these institutions, and if I have anything to say about it, also emulating a lot of these networks uh, that Asia has pioneered. So. If you take a very different United States and you recognize uh, that the United States still does have a tremendous amount of power, there's a final critical dimension to globalization that Minister Yeo touched on but did not elaborate. He said, assuming we keep the peace, there is no reason that we should not see Asia become the center of globalization in the future. That's a huge assumption. Just look back to the last huge wave of globalization. Remember the famous John Keynes phrase about the British gentleman who could wake up in the morning and have you know, his tea from Ceylon and his goods from India and things from China and he could run his businesses all over the world. Extraordinary. We didn't keep the peace. We didn't keep the peace. We had a cataclysm. Indeed, we had two cataclysms. And it is n in no way foreordained that we are going to simply sail on with this current wave of globalization without politics getting in the way. There, at least for the foreseeable future, the United States plays a critical role, and I hope a wiser, humble, humbler, uh, more temperate uh, United States will play that role. But just think, even in Asia, and I am concluding, just think about what we just heard about, the six-party talks. If the United States weren't there, it would be much harder uh, to reach any kind of solution. If it were just China, North and South Korea, uh, and Japan, much harder. You need the United States there. You need the United States there to soften some of those tensions. You just heard Surin talk about the tensions between ASEAN plus three and ASEAN plus six, and he mentioned it very delicately that fissure as to whether you include India and Australia uh, and New Zealand or not. The United States' role there will be very important. How does the United States act toward ASEAN? How does the United States help the powers in the region make those choices? Taiwan. I am living uh, in China this year, and I am very worried. Uh, I am very worried because we face a very critical time in the next six months. If the United States were not there, 
to help hold the balance, to help say on the one hand to the Taiwanese, hold on, we do not want to change in the status quo, but also to talk to China, it could be an even more frightening situation. And even to go back uh, to uh, another era, the era I grew up in, Russia and Europe, things are not always so smooth. On energy politics recently, they've been quite fraught. Good thing the United States is still there and still there in Europe and still engaged with Russia. And finally, the Middle East. We have not exactly been a peacemaker in the Middle East. We have been a war bringer in the Middle East. On the other hand, Americans across the political spectrum understand how essential it is to try to reach a genuine Israeli-Palestinian settlement. And I put to you again, if the United States weren't there, who else could do that now? So I conclude on economic globalization, in many ways, it is Asian globalization. But I suggest to you that in the all-important political sphere that must maintain the peace for those economies to grow, it is still the United States and Europe building and rebuilding a world order and integrating Asia and other regions into it. Thank you. Um, what I have to say on this subject uh, actually nicely follows up uh, on the previous two uh, speeches. In a sense, the question I'm going to ask uh, is, is it, it sort of nicely follows uh, on um, Anne Marie Slaughter's, uh, 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 as it were, claim. And the question is, in a sense, given the fact that uh, there is a tangible shift of power in the global system, in economic terms, certainly, towards Asia, what inhibits it from translating into real political innovation uh, or thinking about a new global governance architecture for the world. Uh, and I think uh, Kishore invited us to sort of offer some provocations rather than instructions. So I'll simply lay down three or four propositions that address that particular question um, and then close with perhaps one thought about the, uh, the United States. Now, there is absolutely no doubt. I mean, this, this is uh, the rise of Asia in all the ways that Minister Yeo described uh, is a truly epochal event, uh, not just for, or, or primarily for, the, I think, the hope it brings to the lives of billions of people. I mean, I think for the first time in centuries, there is a promise that billions will be lifted out of poverty, and I think Asia has to keep focused on that uh, objective. I think there's a renewed cultural self-confidence, uh, which is absolutely astonishing and itself carries certain political ramifications, right? Uh, and is bound to have an impact on the world. Now, the way in which that impact will be felt, and I think um, the simplest way of describing the argument I'm going to present is the title of this panel is Asia's Impact on the Global Governance Architecture. And I think the only thing we can say about certainty is the word impact. There will be impact. But architecture, Asia, and global, I think, still remain in question. So let me just take each of these in turn. First, the phrase architecture. I think one of the things we are seeing at the moment uh, is a shift away from the old kinds of talk we used to have about global governance architecture, which was centered around constitutionalizing a certain kind of global regime, whether it's in architectonic institutions like the United Nations uh, or other kinds of financial institutions. I think what we are seeing at the moment is an amazing array of crisscrossing alliances, summitry processes, networks, socialization processes. I mean, any acronym and any sort of geographical line of connection you can manage is managed to think about is being, as it were, articulated in some kind of institutional form, from the Shanghai Corporation Organization to APEC and so forth, right? And I think one of the things we'll have to perhaps live with is the idea that perhaps the future of the world order will not be centered on a single architectonic form. It will be centered rather on lots of sophisticated, as it were, interactions, power brokering, and perhaps even alliance building and the shape of many of these is not actually clear, clear, clear to us yet. So the form in which the shift of power will be expressed will not be necessarily in old-style new institutions, reform of the UN, and so forth, which may happen, which may not happen, right? 
Uh, it will be in perhaps different kind of symmetry processes. Perhaps G8 will evolve into first into G13, G14, and then perhaps into something else altogether with older powers like Canada and so forth um, uh, dropping out. But the question we need to ask is, will all of this power brokering lead to a certain kind of constitutionalization of the international order and a certain sense of regularity? And here let me be provocative, and I argue that perhaps there's reason to be skeptical that while this power brokering may succeed in creating certain kind of stability, it will be very far from what you might call a just global governance architecture. And the reason for that, to put it in a sentence, is the following. Think of the characteristics that the major powers of the world bring to their brokering deals around the world. United States, the two new major powers from Asia, China, and, and now India, and perhaps Russia as well. What is it that they have in common? First of all, all of them have a great sense of entitlement about their role in world affairs because of their particular histories in different ways. All of them, unfortunately, also believe in great power exceptionalism, which is multilateral institutions are important only insofar as they are projections of national power. There used to be this saying about globalization that globalization would mean think globally, act locally. I think in the case of great powers, you can say it means, uh, as it were, act globally but think locally. That seems to be, in a sense, I think the approach to a lot of this deal making. So you will get, you know, I think, I, th I think they can work together, as it were, to hold the peace. Uh, but you won't get, as it were, a constitutionalized regimen where transparency, accountability, justice, fairness, representation, all nicely harmonize, uh, harmonized uh, uh, together. Right? The second point of sort of skepticism I have is about the term Asia itself. Um, is Asia simply a geographical referent? Now, Minister Yo uh, talked about the palpable fact that there is going to be immense regional integration within Asia in different, different, uh, you know, under different guises, whether it's ASEAN, BIMSTEC, you know, you, again, you can think of a whole range of institutions. Now, even the South Asia, uh, uh, SARC, and, and, and regional, uh, regional cooperation. But I think the simple fact remains that even though there is this economic integration in Asia, the major powers of Asia are still deeply divided by their histories and perhaps by their geographies. Uh, if you take the three major, or three of the major powers in Asia, China, India, and Japan, they have found sophisticated ways of mitigating and managing their conflict. But it is too premature to conclude that they have entirely overcome the burdens of their histories. Uh, and it's also too premature to conclude that their domestic politics is such that it will allow them to confront uh, as it were, the histories of their relationships with each other in a way in which they can easily work together in constitutionalizing a new order. And so long as, in a sense, there remains the possibility of India-China tension, very, very palpable and, and, and can be still invoked uh, in appropriate contexts, China-Japan tensions, so long as those histories are not confronted and overcome, it is very difficult to see the idea of a Asia emerging as some kind of meaningful political referent as opposed to an economic or a geographical referent. The other reason to be skeptical about Asia is the last time there was talk of Asia was uh, at the height of the anti-colonial movements. I mean, there was this kind of great wave of thinking about pan-Asianism. And looking, back, looking at back at those arguments, one of the things that was striking about the ambition then, which I find sorely lacking now, that for all its limitations, there was a sense that, that if Asia is to be a meaningful category in world politics, it must bring something different to world politics than what great powers of the past have done. Right? Some new set of values which will imagine a different kind of world. Now, you could argue that one of the things that Asia brings to the world order, and I think this is what unites all Asian countries, I think, as the previous speakers have suggested, is a certain kind of anti-universalism, right? which is particularly poignant for Asian countries because of their history of colonialism. Right? Uh, the success of Asia in the last few years has been a success of improvisation. It has, you know, none of the countries have followed a textbook model. They have innovated. And I think 
that, that sort of translates into an approach to in international con problem solving and institution building as well, uh, which is that there isn't a single template, there aren't any single bedrock, uh, as it were, universalizing principles around which right, norms and principles of legitimation and institutions must be constructed. So that is a theme that runs across Asia. But beyond that, right, when you think about India, China, perhaps even Japan, uh, uh, Indonesia, Thailand, is there anything different that Asia brings to the table right, that is different from the West, that is different from sort of the, you know, the dominant articulations of the world system? Uh, one way of looking at this question is just go, go, just go down the principal global deadlocks that are facing the world, right? Um, nuclear proliferation and weapons of mass destruction, uh, global warming and the environmental challenge, right? perhaps trade, right? and perhaps human rights as well. Right? Now, it seems to me that on all of these issues, there is a profound ideological deficit in Asia. I think the approach most of the dominant powers in Asia still have is a very, very defensive one, right? which is they're looking out for their national interests within the traditional frame of sovereignty. Almost all of them, at least India and China, are, have at least legitimized nuclear weapons, right? if not actually engaged in uh, uh, proliferation. Uh, I think they have serious challenges to surmount as leaders in thinking about a new environment, an environmental regime for the world. So the big question I think all of us in Asia should be asking is, when we speak of Asia, what it is that we, we, we will bring to the table that will be distinctive from the behavior of great powers in the past? Or will we still repeat the same pattern of, as it were, exceptionalism, defensiveness, and ultimately a recourse to sovereignty? Right? And if that happens, the prospects of global architecture are in a sense dim. Fi just final point, as it were, which is, it is a truism that Asia's role in the world, or the role of individual Asian countries in the world, will depend upon their internal capacities to manage their national transformations. And I think you can still see the way in which right, almost all Asian states, including China and India, the two larger ones, are still works in progress on both dimensions that constitute nation states, which is achieving a sense of complete nationhood and achieving a sense of development. Right? And because their works in progress, right, I think much of their approach to the external world right, is inhibited right, by a sense that, as it were, their internal transformation, whether in the case of China, it's Tibet or Taiwan, in the case of India, whether it's at Northeastern periphery, uh, is not in any way impacted by the stance they take in the international arena. I think India's inhibition in Myanmar is a great example of just that, right, uh, of, of, of that uh, inhibition. And so in, be, because these are, in a sense, rising powers which are not yet fully transformed, you might say that their approach to the world will be driven so crucially by domestic politics in a way in which it has probably not been true as much of other, uh, as it were, great powers. The last and concluding thought is that the terms of discourse in Asia will still be set by the United States. Now, what do I mean by that? I don't mean by that the thought that uh, you know, the United States is going to forever remain a significant player in Asia, or that the United States is necessary for umpiring conflicts in Asia and mitigating them. Uh, I, 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 I think there are reasons to be skeptical or, uh, uh, about that. But it is simply that whenever there is a shift in global politics and new great powers rise, right, they take their terms of reference and what they should, they should aim, from, aim for from powers that have, as it, as it were, currently dominated the world scene. And one of the worries, I think, in the Asian context is that because of the United States' record right, in suspecting multilateralism, in, as it were, yes, mitigating conflict, but on the other hand, also creating the conditions right, where, as it were, uh, uh, an investment in military technology and all the weaponry and, and, and conflict can continue, I think there is a real danger that that race can escalate. 
you can see two things happening in Asia. You can see this sort of you know, circle of economic integration happening, which is the good news, right? You can see a very sophisticated culture of diplomacy emerging. That is the good news. But it is also the case that we are going to see perhaps the most significant expansion of military competition, arms race, the search for bases that Asia has actually seen for a while. And the fact is that so long as right, great power politics remains what it is, which is China says the United States is a potential adversary and invests in technologies that give us the options that it might not otherwise have, right? this whole, as it were, military competition can escalate downwards. We are living with the hope that the forces of economic integration will simply make this military comp competition a sideshow and, and a kind of shadow boxing that states do. But I think at the moment we can say is that's just a hope. Uh, we need to do a lot more to make it a reality. Hello. Yes. Good. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, I want to first of all begin by <coughs> thanking the three panelists for more or less sticking on time. And so we have almost an hour uh, for a good, robust discussion. I'm, I'm amazed at the uh, level of consensus uh, in this panel that, yes, of course, uh, the rise of Asia is going to change everything. Of course, there's no consensus on how, how it's going to change, what's going to happen. So the first question I was going to ask the panelists before I uh, invite you all to come and challenge the panelists is, if you had the same discussion, Anne-Marie, in, in the US or, or even in Europe, would, there, would you have the same kind of consensus that you have up here that, hey, the rise of Asia changes everything? Or would there still be a sense of, hey, you know, you've got to wait some time. They haven't come yet. You know? We can carry on as before. What's, what's your feeling? I was going to ask you first and then Surin, then put up. <clears throat> well, there's no way I can speak for all of the United States, but I would say in every foreign policy discussion I have been a part of mm. for the last two to three years, certainly, mm. uh, there has been tremendous consensus that one of the principal challenges that the United States and Europe face is accommodating the rise of China and India. And with a, a, very sharp awareness that if we get this wrong, it'll be disastrous. And that history is, the record is not good <laughs> for great powers accommodating other great powers. There is Britain accommodating the United States, and then there is uh, Germany, I mean, uh, France and Britain not accommodating the rise of Germany terribly well. We're not going to, uh, uh, the, there was blame on all sides. But so I think there's tremendous awareness uh, that this is a huge issue and a great deal of the uh, concern about Iraq is the sense that we are tied down and all of our uh, intellectual and, and financial and, and military energy is going into the Middle East and we're missing this huge uh, part of the world and we, we really need to be focusing on it. Sorry. Well, I think in the U.S., the, <clears throat> the question would be, yes, Asia is rising. Yes, enormous growth uh, taking place in Asia. But uh, how are we going to go in and, uh, and fit and help? Because there are so many other problems that are occurring in Asia. Uh, there are so many flashpoints. But then, as I said in my opening statement, there are, er there are areas where that tremendous sensitivity between and among the, the partners involved. Therefore, the U.S. must be more careful than before. It's not like Vietnam. It's not like Korea in the past. It's, the, the terrain has changed so much. And I think uh, the complexity that have occurred in the Asia-Pacific, plus the experience in, in the Middle East, in Iraq, uh, has made the U.S. much, much more uh, uh, thoughtful and much, much more reluctant to get involved. Uh, I think uh, the question of Myanmar is, is a good case in point. Whether unilateral uh, action would be helpful, whether it's about sanction or any other forms of uh, involvement, I think uh, the U.S. is much, much more careful, much more thoughtful 
and uh, trying to involve more players into the formula rather than quick response as in the past. But that, <coughs> just you know, in, in terms of understanding the significance of issues, right, I think the, dis the debate in the United States is quite remarkable. Uh, mm -hmm. And, and uh, across any kind of policy forum that I've been in, whether international relations or economics, I think there is consensus. I think the two points of division are, one is whether the United States should aim at maintaining primacy or give up the game altogether. Uh, I think there, there is actually still a lot more consensus on the primacy side that somehow the United States can still find ways of maintaining uh, at least political and institutional primacy. Uh, and the second large question, which is I think an open one, which is as this debate percolates down uh, into sort of popular politics, whether you may begin to see the beginnings of a backlash against globalization hmm. happening as a result. That's, that's an yeah. open question. Can I follow up on that? Yeah, sure, sure, sure. So other Americans in the audience will have their own interpretations of our presidential politics, but I want to follow up on what Pratap said about primacy. One way of reading the difference between the Democrats and I think most of the Republicans is exactly that, that the Republican platform is much more about uh, you know, maintaining primacy uh, and, and thinking you know, we are the hegemon or the, 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 we, we want no peer competitor. The Democrats, although, I think are much more about recognizing we are in a multipolar world with Europe as a major pole, with Asia as a major pole, also looking at, at uh, Latin America. You will not hear that uh, in speeches. It doesn't go over well to tell the American audience, well, you know, we're actually losing power and now it's a multipolar world and Jacques Chirac <laughs> was right and we need to adjust. <laughs> you, that's not what you're going to hear, but the substance of it is I think recognizing primacy doesn't get us anywhere and it actually hurts us in lots of ways. How do we get to a, to a better way of engaging the world? Great, okay, now please, uh, any one of you come to the mic, uh, introduce yourselves and uh, feel free to challenge the panelists. Uh, or ch please go ahead, uh, I, I go, the, okay, go ahead, go ahead, yeah. Hi, uh, I'm Arvind Panagari of Columbia University. Uh, let me challenge you a little bit on this. I mean, you're saying Ch challenge who? Challenge uh, the consensus. <coughs> okay, okay, okay. Challenge yeah. the consensus <coughs> that that the at least from the U.S. perspective that uh, that um, Asia is seen as kind of central uh, to to what it does and what it should be doing. Uh, at least if you look from the perspective of the economic side, where you know lots of the regional arrangements that are forming in in the Asia regions now. It, it appears to me that the U.S. has been pretty much disengaged. Uh, there was a time 10 years ago when you know, the, the East Asian Economic Grouping was being proposed by Malaysia, and at that time, Jim Baker kind of came in board and very rapidly saying, no, 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 this cannot be done without the United States being really deeply involved. Mm -hmm. But since then, and the current administration, particularly the U.S. seems to have become completely disengaged actually from Asia as far as these regional groupings are concerned. And you know, in the very early part of the Bush administration, there was some announcement of this Enterprise of Asia initiative. But after that, at least I didn't hear anything. So. Well, well I think. You I, go ahead, and I'll jump I, I, I think the sense of community in East Asia would not have come without the very, very traumatic experience of the financial crisis. I think the, the idea of Prime Minister Mahathir would not have been, uh, would not have come to fruition without a, the, the experiences that we together in East Asia and demonstrated to the world that somehow we could help each other. U.S. was standing aside and Europe was pretty far from the picture of uh, you know, trying to rescue us from the financial crisis, but countries like Japan, even China, you know, some here, we are trying to come together and try to, to rescue each other. And uh, I think that very experience certainly has led to a higher sense of community, higher sense of regionalism. Therefore, when we could manage, or at least show the world that we could manage our own affairs here in the region, outsiders, uh, First reaction is uh, maybe they can live without us, and uh, that's hurtful. 
They are not going to depend on us anymore. But later on, maybe it is better for them to create, you know, among themselves institutions and, and uh, measures or whatever it is that they can take care of themselves. So in a way, uh, East Asia is moving along, and I think the world is watching uh, with some kind of admiration and some kind of concern at the same time. Whatever it is, I think we are in the transitional period. Everybody has, has to adjust. We have to adjust to the new world. Outsiders will have to adjust to the new world. And institutions that have been established before have to somehow accommodate what's going on in Asia. I think it's a very uh, hard question <coughs> for, for American foreign policy uh, experts as to what's the right balance. Uh, two weeks ago, uh, I was in Tokyo, uh, hosted by Dean Morita, and we were talking about East Asian security architecture. And one American there said, well, I think the view should be the Asians cannot meet without us being there, the, the Jim Baker line. Others said, no, wait a minute. You know, this is like our telling Europe for 40 years. We really want you to develop and take on burdens and do things as Europe. And then the minute Europe tried, we, oh, but you can't do anything without us. <laughs> it's, it's a balance. I mean, you actually want Asia to be able to take care of issues itself. I think one of the, absolutely, one of the lessons is whether it's Africa or Asia, the United States is not going to go in militarily. And if it's not going to go in militarily, it's the region that is going to have to solve this. And at the same time, we have to be engaged. So I would say we should be at some meetings. There should absolutely be some meetings that America is part of. But I think actually Americans have to accept that some things might actually happen without us being there. <laughs> but Top, do you have any point? Uh, no, no, I mean, I, you know, I, I, I agree with you. I, th I think there is a sense in which institutionally you could give some evidence that the United States has been sort of disengaged. Um, but you know, it, it could also be the case that I think I think we are moving at a uh, uh, moving in a direction where you'll get different forms of engagement. You you won't need the United States necessarily present, uh, as it were, uh, uh, at, at 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 every table. But a lot of what happens at those tables is in a sense managed. Um, as it were, off stage bilaterally. So you know, U.S. China summits, summit meetings, those kinds of things feed into these processes. Uh, okay, the U.S. ambassador, Pat Herbold, and then a question over here, and then at the back there. Let's uh, later. First, uh, Pat, then you. There, you're number three for your speech. Yeah. I don't have a question, but I would like to respond to the gentleman's contention that the U.S. is disengaged. Yeah. We are very much engaged in <laughs> Southeast Asia. Now you got your answer. <laughs> <laughs> we have very strong military to military activities, not only with Singapore, but with many of the other uh, countries here in this region. Uh, we have very strong security ties with many of the countries in this region. We have a free trade agreement with Singapore, which since January of 2004, has increased uh, two-way trade by 40%. We have a trade and investment framework arrangement with ASEAN that was signed in 2006. We have day-to-day -day activities uh, that uh, speak to the fact that we are very much engaged in this region. There is no doubt that we have um, areas where we have to devote a lot of attention. Uh, in the Middle East right now, but it does not mean that we have lost interest in Southeast Asia, and we will not. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, <Pat>. <laughs> <laughs> Nick, question over here before you go to Fujin. Over here, please. So can you pass the mic in front here, please? Yeah. And then we go to Fujin. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Laurence Tubiana, Sales for Paris. I'd like to, to ask the panel what they, how the, you assess the current EU-Asian uh, dialogue. Uh, Europe was mentioned several times as a sort of uh, maybe a regional to region uh, partner. And when we look at what the status of the Asian Europe dialogue, dialogue we, we see uh, mainly shortfalls and not a very dynamic relation. First of all, maybe because in the, within the EU scene, political scene, Asia, of course, is a very important factor, but not as, as, a, as a part of the discussion on globalization order. And I think the eyes of Europe uh, are not so much turned towards Asia on this global governance issue, particularly. The businesses in Europe are very concerned, and they have truly an Asian perspective, mainly because more and more the Asian companies are buying them at, in Europe. <laughs> so that gives uh, an information and a signal. I, I don't see that at the political level. 
a, a number of uh, EU countries have established quite significant bilateral dialogues with many governments in Asia, but they are rather technical. They don't have a sort of political uh, uh, consistency. And uh, in a way, paradoxically, Europe is not so much prepared uh, to that discussion with Asia, even if the regional dimension is very strong in Europe. So I'd like to, to understand what, what you think about that. We will go in reverse order now. First up, Sorin and Marie Slotten. I'll get a word too, because I've been watching this. Uh, it, it, it's, it, it, it's probably a good thing that the Europe-Asia dialogue is largely at those technical levels, because I think if you ascend it to a higher level of abstraction, uh, you'll find a lot more points of conflict. Uh, uh, whether it's on nuclear weapons, whether it's on sovereignty, whether it's on global warming, um, uh, democracy promotion, human rights. Uh, you know, th there is a sense, I mean, frankly, if you ask diplomats around, of, of a sort of, in, there's a worry about a sort of European sanctimoniousness without power in that. So, so it's, it's, it's probably good that we take small steps. I think, I think earlier on, in 19... 95, 96, when, when we were going full steam economically and financially, Europe was extremely interested in Asia. And there was an ASIM uh, formula being uh, set up. Uh, during the crisis, after the crisis, you, Europe has lost almost totally interest in Asia. Now you're coming back. And uh, oftentimes, we found out that as Minister Yeo said this morning, you were very much engaged in your own internal issues, expansion, or uh, trying to uh, solidify uh, your own uh, structure. I remember at one of the Asian, uh, ASEM uh, ministerial meeting, or even a summit, Europe was very much engaged in its own constitutional discussion in Nice. So there was only one deputy minister came to talk to uh, the full ministers of, uh, of, uh, of East Asia. That was quite a letdown. Uh, so I think the, the, the inequality of representation of interests or the focus on certain issues of your own interests rather than understanding the whole picture. Some countries in the EU are very fixed on democracy and human rights. Some countries are less uh, you know, vocal about it. More trade, more investment, more technical cooperation. Even though as a unit, even though as an EU, it's difficult for us to relate to uh, the agenda of Europe as, as one. So it is difficult. So it gives the impression that you know, not much is going on. We meet twice a year at the summit. We meet once a year at the ministerial level. but. Uh, not much else, and nothing seemed to be moving. Well, we are now engaging into what you call ASEAN-EU uh, uh, free trade arrangements. I don't know how long that's going to take, but I do hope that there will be enough energy and enough commitment into the process so that can, we can make progress. You know, taking, or, or taking into consideration the diversity on this side of the globe. It's not one either. So if you want to move forward, uh, we have to accommodate some of the differences that many of you could not agree. Thank you. You want to add something? You go ahead. Oh, you want me to go first? Okay. Absolutely. Sure. Okay. Well, I, it's very easy. Actually, I completely agree with Surin. I, I personally participated in the processes to launch the Asia Europe meeting. I went travel all around Europe as the then permanent secretary of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in the mid 1990s. There was tremendous interest in Europe. Uh, then, because uh, East Asia seemed to be, you know, the great big story, then came the East Asian financial crisis, and everything crashed, uh, as Surin said. You know, and and it's amazing how uh, Europe didn't take a long-term perspective on the rise of Asia, and just purely took a very short term. And it's taken almost ten years after the Asian financial crisis for Europe to once again become aware: hey, maybe this is a long-term trend something big, something real is happening. And I would say, if, if, if I want to be, uh, for the sake of being provocative, huh, if you want to see whose mental maps are in alignment with the new world order, I mean, clearly the Asians are obviously understand what, uh, what's happening in this part of the world. In America, there's a much greater realization that the rise of Asia is going to change the world fundamentally. 
in Europe, this hasn't happened yet. And I, and I speak at the intellectual level. And you go to seminars, you go to fora. There isn't this, the, the same degree of awareness of Asia, which I find very, very puzzling. Anyway, Anne-Marie Slaughter. Well, as befits a humbler and more enlightened America, <laughs> I, I would not <laughs> presume to comment on <laughs> EU-Asian relations. The only thing I would say it's is okay. I think why, one of the reasons this is true in the United States is, of course, the huge number of East Asians and South Asians <laughs> Americans. The biggest change in my classroom in 20 years of teaching or 15 years of teaching has been the huge increase in South Asian students, whether they're first generation or second generation or, or whatever the configuration, and East Asian students. And of course, that means Asia is there for us and, and even more so on the West Coast. Thank you. Hu Jun, and then I think the French ambassador, and then I think my friend. Uh, please go ahead, Hu Jun. Sorry, I can't. Please. Speaking of uh, Beijing University, when I look at the title of this conference, Globalization Asia or Asian Globalization, and I have a chance to hear the speakers and the general consensus that Asia, uh, globe, I mean, driving globalization, uh, it's uh, I sort of uh, feel uh, self conceited if you hear that. But I'm a bit concerned uh -huh. uh, because, uh, well, my observation of, uh, say, I cannot speak for other Asian countries, but since I'm a Chinese, I feel more comfortable speaking about China. Now, I see the rise of China, economic rise of China. And I uh, was wondering, what are the principal drivers of that rise? Is it that we Chinese have been defying existing global international organization or the global order? Or are we more become more accepting of the international organization, this existing global order? My answer is uh, we are become more accepting of the international uh, order. And now, if there is a key principle driver uh, for the economic rise of China, is that we are accepting the market principles. It's not that because we are using more of something unique about China. So I guess. My sense is, uh, uh, well, we need to adopt the both, globalization Asia instead of the all, and Asian globalization. I guess that's the process we are going to see uh, in many years down the road. And the United States will continue to have a very important role to play. Now, I put that as a sort of my personal observation. I just want to hear your response to my observation. Thank you. Any response? Uh, quick, I mean, that, you know, that, that, that's a very profound question because one way of looking at this, this title is, 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 is just to sort of say this and look, say the most important fact is Asian countries are accepting integration into the global economy, largely in the rise of market principles. And that's, that's really the driver, not just the driver, uh, but as it were, the bedrock normative principle that's going to sustain this globalization. And I think I think you're correct. I mean, I think I think that's that that is probably a story you can tell about most most of Asia. Um, I think the reason we ask this question this way about sort of you know Asian globalization as, as something distinct from simply the principle of the market is that when you come to think of things like uh, governance institutions, political identities, uh, then one argument would go that look over time all that will matter is this market integration those other axes of conflict and those other forms of relating to the outside world will not matter. But you're not quite there yet. And so the question then we pose is, what is going to be, as it were, the drivers of those other dimensions of relating to the world, uh, which are not purely determined, as it were, by the market, market principle? I think, I think, put it differently, I think China has certainly accepted the international norms, particularly in the economic uh, arena. But I think also, also China is playing with those norms very, very cleverly. Uh, if, you, if you accept the norms completely, then uh, there won't be any talk about the pressure in Washington just last week. The appeal that China should uh, reconsider the value of the yuan, that is not subjecting to the market forces. That is certainly being managed in order to somehow keep the 
impacts and implications of devaluing of, of, of uh, you know, other currencies against, against the yuan. Uh, so China is, is not just accepting the norms and the rules and regulation of the international community, but also trying to play with those norms cleverly in order to maintain its own uh, interests, its own uh, 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 advantage. I think in the international uh, uh, areas, uh, you know, the, the willingness to open up on the issue of the Darfur, and you can see some movement toward a more dynamic involvement on the issue of Myanmar, because, and certainly the you know the lead, leading role on the North Korean or Korean Peninsula issues, I think China is accepting the rules and the norms, but at the same time, pick and choose when and what to do and how to contribute. And that is a very, very uh, cleverly way of uh, managing the international institution. I, th I think that's right on the normative side, and it goes to the question Pratap asked us, which is on, in terms of the norms, the global constitution, will there be a distinctive Asian contribution? And the jury still out. Institutionally, though, I, I laid out a world in which the United States was, is a unitary state. The EU is something other. I spent a huge amount of time trying to explain to Americans that, no, the EU is not going to be the United States of Europe, but even though it's not going to be the United States of Europe, that doesn't mean it doesn't count. I mean, Americans have this binary view. It's either nothing or it's going to be a unitary state. And my response is, no, no, no. The EU is pioneering a genuinely new form of international organization where there's pooled sovereignty, but you maintain the nation state. That, though, is still a highly legalized version. That's what I started out to say. It assumes homogeneity of, of uh, uh, regime type. You have to be a liberal democracy. You have to accept these things. My question is whether Asia is going to be pioneering a different kind of new international regional uh, entity that is more diverse than the European uh, entity, uh, that is not a unitary state, that offers a, a yet another model for Latin America, for Africa, for the Middle East, for other regions to look at. My answer to you is yes, just read my next book. Well, <laughs> but I look forward to the debate. <laughs> Pujan, uh, my, my response to you is that the, I think it's timing. At this stage, China is such a huge beneficiary of the current global order that it doesn't serve China's interests at this stage to rock the boat in any way. But in due course, you know, as the economic and political space that China occupies grows bigger and bigger, the mismatch between the economic and political space it occupies in real terms and the economic and political spaces it, it, it occupies institutions like G8 and so on and so forth, when that contradiction, to use a famous Maoist word, becomes very big, then the change will come. So I think it's, it's only a matter of, uh, in due course, there will be bigger changes coming. That's my answer to you uh, in terms of Asian globalization. But we have the French ambassador, one question there, and then uh, we'll try and see whether they can move at a rap rapid clip because suddenly, towards the end, all the hands come up, you know? <laughs> you Pierre. Cool. Thank you, questions. Pierre Buller. I'm the French ambassador to Singapore. And uh, there's one, one issue, Asian issue, where Europe, both Europe and the United States are uh, significantly involved, which is Burma. Yeah. And uh, regarding Burma, I have a question for uh, Surin Pitoan. Uh, Mr. Minister, I, I was highly impressed and have high regard for your plea for uh, Burma uh, to be resolved by regional uh, organizations, namely ASEAN, and with no interference from uh, outside powers. But how do you reconcile this plea uh, with the fact that after 10 years of constructive engagement from the side of ASEAN, uh, Burma has, in, in by their own admission and in their own words of Minister George Yeo, switched the reverse gear. Well, I think um, in the past, the issue of Myanmar has been uh, ASEANized through the admission of Burma into ASEAN. I think what happened three weeks ago 
we are now talking about regional mechanism. We are now talking about involving countries like China, country like India, not only going to be the responsibility for the work of the ASEAN countries or ASEAN 9 trying to solve the problem of Myanmar anymore. My argument is if there is an argument in New York at the Security Council that the Myanmar issue is still very much domestic. It's not regional, it's not international. When you bring the framework for the solution, from what I heard, I don't know if it's true, that the Perm 5 is going to be involved, meaning France too, and uh, Norway, and Japan, and India, and China, plus one or two or three from, from uh, ASEAN, that's going to be much, much more than internationalizing it. So there will be definite resistance. My uh, thinking is that look at the, the way we solve, or at least we try to solve the Korean Peninsula. We solve um, the East Timor in the first phase of it. We solve Aceh. It's pretty much began here in the framework of the regional uh, powers, regional players. Later on, others could come in as friends of, as supporters of, as those who want to help. That, that's my, my point. Uh, in the beginning, if you open it up too far, too big, it's going to be too complicated. And there will be tremendous resistance from opening up the issue to the world. Okay. Now we have one. We have, I want to take two questions here, you <coughs> and the gentleman right behind you. And then I'm going to go to the back. Please go ahead. Yeah. Yes, I'm Peter Chen from the University of Hong Kong. And I think Anne Marie's law has raised a very important issue. And if I understand correctly, you have highlighted the importance of new international networks of experts and government officials dealing with a lot of new issues, most importantly, non traditional security issues. Now, it seems to me that uh, there are already international regimes and international organizations that deal with those issues. So how will the new pattern or the new networks emerge, you know, like uh, World Health Organization? And secondly, we have speakers talking about the Asian way of doing things, you know, including um, kind of incrementalism, uh, smaller scale of dealing with a problem. So how will the Asian way of dealing with those issues, like health or finance, uh, impact on the new, new networks? You know, I would like to see the response from other respondents as well. Thank you. Can I just take the question behind you? Please, can you pass the mic to the... Please. Can I just go on? Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm from uh, Japan. Uh, my name is Mehara from Hitotsubashi University. I have. Uh, sorry, 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 from where? I didn't hear. Uh, from Hitotsubashi University, <laughs> which is very difficult to pronounce, I know. <laughs> very Thank long you. word. Um, I have a challenge and a question to Mr. Pitswan, ah. if I understand correctly. Okay. Uh, he said financial crisis in the late 1990s strengthened the kind of sense of community in Asia. Is that, am I right in understanding that? And um, as a result, you can see all kinds of financial arrangements among Asian countries. For example, like swap arrangements among central bankers in Asia. Uh, there are dozens and dozens of these arrangements being uh, incorporated, mostly bilaterally. And um, if you look very closely, most of the currencies are against the US dollar. I mean, it's just kind of lending currencies in times of crisis. And uh, except if I remember correctly, between China and Japan, it was between yuan and the Japanese yen, all the other arrangements are basically against the US dollar because in times of crisis, you need US dollar to save your country. But unfortunately, the US dollar is not your home country currency. So if you think that you're strengthening the sense of community among yourself without the main actor, which is the counterpart in terms of the currency, I really don't know whether it's, you can really call it the true sense of the community in terms of the financial stability, because all the investors in the whole world will know that if the United States is going to back up this financial arrangement, a limitless amount of US dollar being provided if necessary, nobody's going to believe your swap arrangement. That's one of my questions, whether how do you think about it. Another thing is about, let's say then, whether we have something like euro, like in Europe. Euro is a common currency in Europe. In Europe, Do we have any move towards the common currency in Asia? Nobody's going to agree. Who is going to take initiative? Who is going to lead the leading role? 
If you look at the common uh, currency or uh, the close to that is a kind of basket system. Most of them are the US dollar and the euro are the main portion. So you're talking about the kind of independent sort of arrangement to the community without these major financial infrastructure, which has seemed to be at least now based in the US system. So that's Thank my second question. Thank you. So I'll, I'll ask Anne-Marie to answer the first question, then Surin, second question. So uh, on the first question, uh, when I published the article in, in uh, 1997, I called it the real new world order. And I said, you know, the, these networks are going to be the wave of the future, and we don't need the UN. Five years later, I, as I said, a slightly humbler view, uh, I, I wrote and believe strongly it's going to be a combination. We do need huge reform, I think, in, in almost all the, the traditional international institutions, starting with the UN and the Security Council. The IMF needs major reform. The World Bank is, is getting it. I see uh, a combination whereby there's some decisions that can only be taken at a, both a, a, a formal international institution and one that actually accepts the norms of, of equality. Uh, and the, those, um, when those decisions are taken, though, they can't, there's no implementation. There's no, there are no tools uh, that are beyond the, the will of individual national governments. So I see these networks in both directions, implementing what is decided, say, at the World Health Organization, but then a much broader uh, set of networks. Uh, and on, at the same time, bringing issues for decision to the higher institutions. And as I said, they often play a role where they help states converge uh, in ways that then make a formal treaty possible. Uh, so I, th I think that's going to be a, the challenge for architects of the international system. The question as to what role Asia will play, this again goes in many ways to what Surin was talking about, which is does the ASEAN way work with respect to a more heterogeneous group of states. Uh, because the, the, if we look at Africa, we look at the Middle East, we look at Latin America, you don't see the EU and you don't see the US. You see a group of quite diverse states. I argue that these networks are ways of dealing with states that have very different political values in ways that are technocratic, but also socializing them in other ways as well. Asia is going to have to prove that that works, but I think there's, it's looking pretty good. Yes, when I say the, when I said the financial crisis certainly helped create a sense of community among us, I didn't mean the community is already here. I mean the sense of community growing. And I would just say, repeat, that without the financial crisis, the, the ASEAN plus three would not have happened. The East Asian summit, the East Asian community would not have come into being as it exists now. So it gave impetus to, to a lot of us who have been reluctant about creating closer and more uh, integrated community here. That, that's one thing. And uh, of course they were talking about Asian born, they were talking about Asian currency, but it's not there yet. And I think there are others outside who would, would rather see this to, you know, to be uh, a bit, you know, waiting rather than coming into force now because we are still so very, very diversified among us, very different among us. So a sense of community is certainly building, but the, the mechanisms and the institutions and the areas and projects that would solidify us still remain to be worked out. And uh, Japan certainly has been leading. China certainly has come around trying to build this community together. It's not there yet, but it is growing and uh, financial crisis has served us well in that direction. And I think the world is watching and uh, I hope the world also will make adjustment rather than derailing the sense of community that is, being, that is growing among us. Thank you. Thank you. Two questions at the back, one from a professor in our school uh, and then a student, I believe, uh, Gopi and then the student. And then I'll come over there. Hello, uh, I'm Gopi Ratnaraj from uh, the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy. I'm quite surprised that uh, so far there's been no mention of the word democracy in, in, the, in the debate. My question is, is globalization, will, or will globalization bring the desirable benefits for Asia and Asians? 
in the absence of democracy. Hmm. So, so you, you're talking about which Asian countries? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Hello, thank you, Dean. Uh, my name is Imelda Maidir. I'm MPP junior. Uh, I'm working for the uh, Research Institute TSI Jakarta. We are welcoming uh, Mr. Surin as our next uh, ASEAN Secretary Chairman. Uh, that's why I have a challenge question for you. Uh, I'll refer to your previous statement that uh, diversity among across the ASEAN countries will be main concern issue for the regional integration uh, in ASEAN in particular. Uh, as a result, uh, we have been aware that with uh, the forming of free trade agreement by bilateral basis, uh, for example, Singapore, uh, US, and uh, Singapore, China, uh, which in turn make the regional integration goals and the managing of spaghetti, uh, spaghetti boys even more complicated. And unfortunately, uh, I uh, believe that ASEAN Secretariat uh, has no legal power to overcome uh, this issue to uh, reach consensus among the countries. So uh, my question is, uh, how will you overcome this issue as our next uh, ASEAN Secretary Chairman? Thank you. Wow, good. Okay, uh, uh, let me, uh, okay, Prasad, you'll answer the question of democracy, uh, uh, okay. since you write a lot about the subject. <laughs> Very quickly, uh, I mean, you know, I, I, I think sort of three quick points, right? One is we can have a philosophical debate about democracy, and, and let's bracket that for a minute. Uh, Second is a political debate, which is, it is certainly true that I think you know, any society needs a way of, as it were, managing disagreements with minimal coercion and minimal cost. Uh, uh, you know, so forget whether human rights are universal, I mean that, you know, but just as, a, just, as a, just, a, just as a political problem. And, and I, think, I think you are going to see sort of you know, challenges of that kind arising in Asian societies that don't have those mechanisms. Uh, and a lot of those societies are going to adapt by improvisation and slowly. Uh, uh, maybe one or two may, one, one or two may break, break, break down. Uh, but I think, I think that requires some, political, some, some delicate political judgment. The third level is whether democracy promotion should be a norm in the international system, or whether being a democracy should, uh, you know, there's this idea being floated of the concept of democracies, for instance, in the, in the Asian, Asian context. That idea, I think, frankly, is, 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 is a big mistake. I don't think you promote democracy by elevating democracy to a norm of the international system. You, okay, okay, I'm going to let him answer the, the question of ASEAN, and you can come back on democracy quickly, because I saw, lots of questioners have been raising their hands over there. But sorry. Let, let me begin by saying that the Secretariat is the instrument of the leaders and the ministers. Uh, very, very, you, you mean you're not very the boss? strict. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be the boss over in, in the Secretariat, but certainly not the boss on policies. Uh, they will set the decisions, they will set the policies, and you know, the Secretariat will have to implement them. But um, the diversity among us is enormous. Per capita income, the lowest per capita income uh, in the member is 205 per year dollars. And the highest is something like 50. I don't want to tell you which country is 50. But uh, so there's a, that big gap. So anything we want to move, we have to consider the pace that would be comfortable to all, and that is very, very slow pace. But uh, the charter next month and the secretariat will be given more mandate and clearer responsibility. I think the, the, the role of persuasion, the, the power to, to, to engage and to guide will certainly help us to move along in the direct, direction of more integration. I don't think the trade agreements between you know, some of the ASEAN countries with outsiders would somehow obstruct our own uh, process of integration, as is we have done pretty well in reducing our own uh, tariffs, our own taxes between us and among us. We have grown in our internal trade among ourselves enormously. And by, 19, by 2015, we will certainly achieve some kind of uh, what we call economic community that would see more of the ingredients of integration. And uh, I, I, think, I think we have to make use of those spaghetti, uh, spaghetti lines crisscrossing between us and among us with outsiders. Singapore and the U.S. 
and Singapore and, and Japan, Singapore and, and Australia. But through those lines of connectivity, the rest of ASEAN being becoming more and more one integrated market will benefit. I think the relationship between the US and Singapore certainly has benefited some part of Australia, some part of Indonesia, if not all. So that kind of uh, spillover effect certainly will help us to become more uh, integrated and, and, and becoming one market, not at a pace that we would like to see it, but so far we have been together for 40 years, and incrementally we are working in the direction of one ASEAN, one market. I do hope that we will achieve that soon. Thank you. You have a quick word? And Two sentences, because <clears throat> I can't not respond. Democracy is a international norm. It is, you know, Boutros Booster Scali put forward an agenda for democracy. I believe the ASEAN Charter will talk about democracy. President Hu Jintao mentioned democracy almost as much as George W. Bush did. Uh, I think the real question is how do you support democracy, not how you promote it. How do you support Democrats who want their country to be more responsive to the desires of the people? Uh, and we can debate at other times what are the best mechanisms. Okay, I think you, at least the, the two questions, the gentleman in front of, okay, Sunil, you can go first, then the gentleman in front of you, then one more. Um, you can I'm identify with the, yourself. I'm with the IMF Institute here in Asia. Um, I have a broad, broad question for the panel. Um, it's about many of the international institutions are in the business of providing. L louder, sir. Uh, many of the uh, uh, international institutions are in the business of providing global public goods and in the business of doing surveillance on their own political masters, which I think uh, is, is difficult in the best of times. Um, how do you see, given the changing uh, economic and political terrain, um, affecting the design of these institutions to provide these uh, public goods and in, the, uh, uh, and in ruthless truth-telling uh, um, about uh, these issues. And the second question is, besides these organizational incentives which should be put in place, given the theme of the conference, is there uh, an Asian view on these issues, which is distinct from uh, other views? Gentleman in front of you, then. Thank you. Now, Friedberg, Public um, MPA Paris. Um, my question comes back both to what Anne-Marie Slaughter uh, reminded us of and, and about Asia. You talk about Asian globalization. Maybe the answer is in Kishore's book, but uh, <laughs> um, why not talk about Chinese and Indian globalization? And why talk about Asia? And what is the internal power differential between the different countries? I mean, will China be a leader of Asia? And will other Asian countries accept this? And how will India re re react to such a pretension? So what are, what's the potential of conflict, intra-Asian conflict? And how can Europe and, and, and America play on these potentials? A play on the potential mean take advantage of it, or? <laughs> in old power game. Oh, in old the power old games. power game. I see. Div divide and rule, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. Please. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Thank you. I'm from Moscow. Uh, we are too polite to each other, seemingly, because I remember still very clearly how enthusiastic we were about globalization in the 90s until 9-11 prompted us something quite different. Nobody ever mentioned anything about possible negative impact of, of Asian globalization on the world. For instance, from Russian perspective, it seems that Asian globalization, which I welcome, uh, may uh, provoke major redistribution of energy supply, which may be very discomfortable for Russia. What would be your comments? Okay, I think, you know, since we have already reaching four minutes to 11, this will be the last round of responses. And I'll give each panelist uh, two minutes or so to, to respond to everything and any other final comments you may have. 
But Sunil, your question about uh, the, the surveillance and new, and, and new mechanisms and all actually will be addressed in the next panel. We're going to have a very distinguished uh, panel led by uh, Sir Howard Davis talking about the financial and economic architecture. So I think if you don't mind, you, you, you'll rephrase your question for the next panel. Uh, but anyway, uh, would you all like to start? Uh, Pratap, you want to? Is, is your mic on? Well, you can't hear you. Yeah, but put up your mic. Is it up? Yeah. <laughs> oh, no wonder. <laughs> I was wondering what happened to your voice. It is too consistent that it's changing. It's still on. It's raised higher. Yeah. Is, it, is it on? It is. <laughs> no. Turn it off. Um, it is too premature to talk about uh, Asian globalization. I mean, I think, I think Asia, we have to think harder about what the reference Asia means. Certainly as non-Western in a certain meaning of the term that you know, Asia carries um, a, a, a certain resonance. Uh, but there are certainly enough tensions within Asia for, that, you know, for one to be optimistic about that. Uh, you're, you're whether, whether you can talk about Asian globalization or Indian globalization or Chinese globalization or not, I think uh, the, the continent of Asia certainly has put enormous pressure on the existing institutions of, of, of the world uh, supervising globalization. Uh, I, I think the ASEAN approach would be let us serve as a, the fulcrum a power play, particularly between those two giants emerging, China and India, rather than giving you know, India, which will be suspicious of by China, or giving it to China, which India will not feel comfortable, and Japan coming into the mix. I think ASEAN is sitting as the fulcrum of power plays for the Asia-Pacific region. That's why ASEAN processes have been rather popular. People and powers come into ASEAN with confidence, with comfort, knowing that they won't be um, you know, losing their, their interests or their uh, goals and their vision will not be obliterated. So they come here with, with full confidence. I, I think um, we have begun to put in our own imprint on the process of globalization. I think uh, many, many uh, institutions of the past have to accommodate, have to adjust. Therefore, this is a transitional period. You can't just see that this is something that ASEAN Asian has to contribute and it's going to be very Asian on world affairs. Not there yet, but certainly I think together the world, the institutions and the Asian countries can work toward a better world. What is a better public good than prosperity, than security, than peace, than order. And I think Asia has been able to maintain that quite well with the support from outsiders, of course. But eventually, we are working incrementally to put our own imprint in our own institutions here in the Asia Pacific. Thank you. So Pratap asked us whether the economic entity that is Asia will also uh, have equivalent political weight or growing uh, political weight. And to me, the answer is exactly uh, whether it can be seen as Asia and not simply as China and India uh, and other individual countries. Uh, my colleague, John Eikenberry, has an article in Foreign Affairs, uh, the new issue, where he says Americans should stop thinking about America versus China or America and China and rather think about China and the West and that when you broaden that out it looks very different than two powers suddenly facing each other. And similarly I think if it, the, the whole the power of regionalization as Europe demonstrates beyond any other is that a regional framework can dissolve traditional great power rivalries. We no longer worry about France and Germany and Germany uh, in England, uh, Germany, uh, in, in Europe. That's the promise. Uh, it does, it may not happen, and even if it does happen, that's where I'll end, it, it then asks the question, what about those countries that are not part of the regional entity? What about Russia, which is not going to be part of 
this kind of Asian entity. What about the United States, which maybe can play a role with all, but is, is not going to be part of its own for some time? That's a new political geography where you have major powers, regions, and powers within regions. So let, 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 me, let me try to end uh, with uh, hopefully good news, OK? Two pieces of good news. First, uh, in response to your question, Erhard, there is actually an Asia. And the good news is that what seemed to be, at one point in time, a success story confined to Japan, the Four Tigers, some ASEAN countries, China and India, is basically spreading all over Asia. And there is, among the Asians, a very strong realization that this is our moment. If we focus now on what we need to do to develop our societies, we can take off. So the, the kind of massive learning process that is taking place among Asians is something actually that happens under the radar screen, has not been noticed. But it also explains why it's spreading so widely. I mean, how did Vietnam, after 40 years of fighting, suddenly become the new Asian economic tiger? Why? It suddenly bought this whole idea that we in Asia can do it. The second piece of good news is that I think as the Asian countries are rising, it, is, it, it could actually have been conceivable that you could have seen all kinds of divisions, tensions, rivalries rising. Now, there are tensions, there are rivalries, but they are, in terms of a trajectory, diminishing. And what you see is a much higher level of dialogue. And you see this in the ASEAN alphabet soup of uh, organizations. You know, ASEAN's capacity to create opportunities for the Chinese and Japanese to talk comfortably to each other. ASEAN's capacity to get the Chinese and Indians to talk comfortably to each other is a remarkable thing. And so therefore, it's not just China's globalization or India's globalization. It is an Asian uh, globalization story. And in some ways, I think basically, as I said, we will never reach a consensus, <laughs> uh, despite the rich discussion we've had on many of the questions. But by and large, I think there should be a consensus that this is an issue that should be addressed. And frankly, a setting like this, uh, which brings together uh, public policy schools from all over the world, is actually an ideal setting to discuss this. And here I want to, by the way, now just make some quick uh, procedural points. I'm not sure whether our master of ceremony is going to do something also. But I'm just going to mention to you, please, we have a very good schedule of meetings. I hope that you will try to come back here at uh, 11.30. Uh, in the afternoon, we have the breakout sessions. But the critical thing I want to emphasize to you all is please uh, make sure you turn up at the president's uh, istana <laughs> on time today. We are very highly privileged uh, to have him host us. So we, we're trying to get you out of here by 4.15 to go back to your hotels, take off your jackets, take off your ties. Uh, have a 10-minute nap, uh, uh, and then proceed uh, to the stand-up. Let me, let me turn over to the Master of Ceremonies, please. For those who have not collected their invitation cards, you can do so during the tea or the lunch time at the OTA Palm uh, conference room. Right now, it's the tea break. Please proceed down one level down to the second floor and be back at 11.30. Thank you. And join me in thanking the panel. Wonderful discussion. Yeah. Excellent.